And uh, Mike's mom is here tonight. Shirley, I'm so glad you're here. Tell y'all, tell them. Yeah, I, I, he's awfully quiet. All right. Let's begin with a word of prayer. We've been uh, starting for some time with a prayer for our nation, and then we added uh, a prayer for Israel. And uh, we want to remember our nation. <clears throat> Israel, I started tonight to, to talk quite a bit about that. Uh, there's headlines the last couple of days that King Bibi has fallen from the throne. And so uh, Netanyahu is, is not any longer prime minister. Things are changing. And uh, it's going to be very interesting to watch and see what happens in Israel. Uh, we're, we're in the process of major, major change. And Israel is going to be in the process of major change or has been for a good while. And we kind of set the standard for the rest of the world. So uh, <clears throat> the world may be in problems, having problems. So we need to pray for our nation. Pray for this. Yes, Mike. Uh huh. Good. How about that? Maxine. Right, right. He, he's done some really good things recently, and that's, uh, you know, we have to draw some lines. We've been talking about this for several years, that God is drawing lines, and I believe he is, and we're beginning to take sides and it is it does cause a division in our nation, but I, it has to be. I'm sorry? Yes, it is. Yes, it just hasn't been spoken maybe as loudly as it is right now. Fantastic. Okay? Well, let's pray for our nation. Mike just stood up, so I'm going to ask him if he'll lead our prayer. <laughs> pray for our nation. Pray for Israel. Thank God for what's, what's happening. Amen. Thank you, Mike. Well, <clears throat> we're reading through the Bible again. Surely, I think you know this, but uh, the other people, people like Ms. Rhodes have read the Bible every day for years and years, and these little small Baptist churches like in Tulia, I know they read the Bible and study the Bible, but a big part of Christians... Uh, don't read the Bible every day, and, and we should. So we're trying to make it, this is year 14, 15, somewhere along that, that we're reading through the Bible, and we try to discuss what we've read. Uh, we can't discuss everything that we've read this week, but uh, I do want to try to work on that and try to help us. We're in First Kings, and we're going to do a little introduction into Kings, remind us about what happens in Kings, and we're going to look at one chapter in a few minutes. We're reading Acts 9 through 13. Uh, there's a lot going on in Acts, the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. And we've had several lessons there, and we'll have some more. We're looking in Psalms. We're finishing up 
the Psalms of Ascent, and we're going to look at one little short one there, and we're reading in Proverbs. That's the readings for the week on the screen, June 13 through 19. I trust that you've read at least up through today. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that we've been looking at are the scriptures, and this is in Proverbs. There's a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. We need to really be aware that it's not just what we think's right, but it's what God thinks right. We've added that scripture in Matthew 7 that we've quoted and looked at a whole lot for a long time that says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. In evangelism, we don't talk about this too much. And people that are, are evangelizing and trying to win people to the Lord don't, don't normally say, listen, if you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, it's hard. <laughs> right? But those that have known the Lord for many, many years can attest that it's not an easy journey. It is narrow. It is hard. And it does bring um, difficulties into our life. But the rewards are just unbelievable. And the peace and the joy that it brings changes our lives. Joseph? Okay. All right. Thank you. Malachi 3 6 is another verse that we've looked at the last couple of weeks. I am the Lord. I don't change. And we have to believe that. Numbers 23 says, I do not lie and I never change my mind. I made you a promise and I'll keep it. That's God speaking to us. Now, let's look in the Psalms real quickly. We got a little bitty psalm that I wanted us to look at as we end up the Psalms of Ascent. I think most everybody here knows about the Psalms of Ascent. They were the Psalms that everyone memorized, and parents' responsibility was to teach their children on the road to Jerusalem. And then at Jerusalem, they would recite these Psalms as a part of their worship while they were there. And they would refresh themselves with these again on the, road, on the way home. And so in the Shema, when we talk about uh, that it's our responsibility to teach our children uh, as we go along the, the way, when we get up, when we lie down, it's our responsibility. There's an indication there of, of the Psalms of Ascent. So those are Psalm 120 through Psalm 134. And they are uh, used during the pilgrimage going to Jerusalem. So we're going to look at Psalm 133, and we're going to read the whole thing, okay? It's not too long, though. Psalm 133. Now, go back. We did this last week. Go back and remember that parents are teaching their little kids these psalms by rote saying it over and over and over. And the way you teach someone like that is that you talk about what it means, you know, and, and so they're going to ask you, well, what does this mean? So we're going to look at it as we go through. First verse says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Okay? Now, I kind of read between the lines sometime, and I think, Parents are going along with all their little kids and all their neighbors are with them and they've got this whole group of people and the kids are all out playing and there might have been a problem, you know. And so the, the moms and, are talking to their, their kids and saying, you know, it's really a good thing. You need to learn it's a good thing when we get along. Could that, could that be added into that maybe? Possibly that happened. 
But that's what they're trying to do. And so this psalm, it's short and quick, and the kids can learn it. How good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It goes on the next verse, but I want to stop there for a minute. What, what are they talking about? Anointing. Do we talk about the anointing? Maybe not enough. Should we be teaching our children about God's anointing? Yeah. Yeah. And this is symbolic of that because some of the moms or dads might have said, don't you remember when we were at the temple and they anointed the priest? You know? This anointing, it's like that oil. It runs down on them. That's what we're talking about. Brotherhood. Brothers getting along. Brothers and sisters. It runs down the beard of Aaron. The priest. Running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon. Which falls on the mountains of Zion. What do we know about Hermon? Okay, all right. Anything else? Maybe it's considered a portal. It's where there were a lot of different groups set up their worship. There were idol worship that happened there. There was Baal worship that happened on Hermon. And I think that's where Jesus took his inner three circle for the transfiguration. We're not positive about that, but it sure makes a lot of sense. It's there where they were, close. It's like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord, who... The yud heh vav -Hey, we'll put his Hebrew name there, has commanded the blessing life forevermore. So what did he command? A blessing. And what is the blessing? Life. We've been celebrating life now for how long? Several weeks we've been talking about life. What is life? Well, life is much more than breath. Life's much more than a heartbeat. Life's much more than what we consider life in this body. And he says it's life forever, eternal. And that's a blessing. Now, it could be a curse if you're on the wrong side of the line. Right? Because someone has said everybody is going to spend eternity somewhere. Well, that's the whole psalm, three verses. We made it through there, didn't we? Okay, now I want us to look at First and Second Kings, a little introduction stuff that we've gone over in the past, but we need to refresh our memory and see what's happening. We started in, in First Kings. Um, First and Second Kings is a part of a larger collection, we would say today, uh, that, that starts with Joshua and goes through Esther. There's 12 books. Some of them are pretty good-sized books. And it would be known as the former prophets. In Hebrew, they would call it the former prophets. Now, I may have known this in the past, but it just never really grabbed me. Before the Greek Septuagint was translated, that was one book. All 12 of those were all together. It was just one book, the former prophets. And then they started dividing it up, and we got First and Second Kings out of that. But those, those 12 books were all put together. like That, that might have been 12 chapters in it. I really don't know how it was laid out. 
but that's interesting and that may help us a little bit realize the continuity that fits together with these books of the prophets, okay? Uh, First Kings uh, coupled with Second Kings covers about 410 years of history and it began about 970 B.C. So we see where that was established during the time of, of King David. So little historical parts real quick here. David becomes the king of Judah in approximately 1010. There are some that disagree a few years, but that's close. We're talking B.C. <clears throat> he becomes king over all Israel in 1003, after he had been king uh, for seven years, then, then we have all Israel comes under one head. Uh, he conquers Jerusalem in about 1000, and then Solomon becomes king in about 970. When we open the book, King David is old. I don't know how you picture him. That's some artist or somebody thinks that that's what King David looked like and sitting out on his balcony. I don't know. The book's divided into three, three groups, and we're uh, working into the second group this week. The first part of it, beginning in chapter 1, is when Adonijah uh, tries to take the throne. He's one of... of uh, Solomon's brothers, and he uh, takes the throne or, or declares that he is king. And then Solomon, after that, with Bathsheba and, and all that with the king, we read that this last week, uh, Solomon is declared king and he is anointed and uh, becomes clean, king. And then we have David's charge to Solomon in chapter 2. And chapter 2 spills over. It's actually divided. They figure that's the second part of the book. And that's Solomon's reign over the United Kingdom. This is before we have the divided kingdoms, but the United Kingdom. And uh, in chapter 2, he deals with his opponents. We find out about God giving him the gift of wisdom in chapter 3. Chapter 4 lists his officials and how he organized the country and how everything was working. Uh, in chapter 5, he builds the temple. And uh, then the, the next chapters talk about his fame worldwide and people coming to see him and listen to him. The scripture tells us about all the things that he has wisdom in from the, the animals to the plant life to all the different things, the stars etc., as far as, as uh, the wisdom and people come to study under him. And then chapter 11 is where we're going to look tonight, the very end of the second part. Then a little preview of what you're going to read the rest of this week and some of next week is when the kingdoms are divided, uh, Judah's king is Rehoboam, Israel's king is, is Jeroboam, and uh, we have all of this division and all the problems that happen. King Ahab comes on. We have the prophet Elijah, and we have the conflict there. We have the Baal worship and uh, the defeat of the Baal priests. That's all coming in the, the last part of this book. And I want to take just a few minutes real quick and help us remember where David came from. <laughs> and what he's leading to. So this is the house of David, or beginning with Jesse. So David is kind of highlighted in yellow, but it actually starts with Jesse, and I'll put a yellow box around that. And you'll see the, the brothers and sisters of David. He comes down the line. He's not firstborn by any means. And uh, uh, we see that, that Jesse's son, David, is in the lineage that we're looking at. And then David marries Ahinoam and has a son named Amnon. And Amnon liked his sister, half-sister Tamar. And remember the story where he raped Tamar. 
And Absalom, which is Tamar's brother, didn't like that very much, and so he killed Amnon. So he doesn't have rights to the throne. And then Absalom, you remember what happened to him? He's the guy with the long, beautiful, flowing hair, and he's running from this group of marauders, and uh, he gets his hair hung in the tree, and they take a lance and run him through and kill him. So he dies, so he's out of the picture. Tamar's a lady, and so Adonijah thinks he's in line for the kingdom, and he declares that he's in line for the kingdom. Uh, knowingly or not, uh, Bath, he, I don't know if he knew that Bathsheba and, and David had agreed that Solomon would become king or not, but he tries to sneak that in and get it done. And then we realize that Solomon takes the kingdom and, and the leadership there. And so through Bathsheba, we have the lineage of Jesus Christ. Yeshua. And so we follow that lineage from Jesse right down there. That's recorded as recorded in Matthew 1 7. I don't know if you've ever stopped and compared Matthew 1 7 and Luke 3 31, that passage in, in Luke chapter 3. You might want to sit down and read that sometime. And I have questions about it. I don't have good answers. So we, we're not going to talk about that tonight, but we may in the future figure out what we, we understand about this lineage, okay? So I need to jump into the book because that's where we're, we're, our discussion is going to come from. We're First Kings, so you can open your Bibles, and uh, I'm going to be using the ESV. Oh, I didn't change that because I picked up this slide, and it's got the NASB. That's what, three or four years ago. I picked up these two slides, and then I just duplicated them. So I, I bet it says NASB all the way through. I apologize. It's really the ESV. I'll show you in a second. So as we looked at, the, at our scripture a minute ago, we realized at the very beginning, David is old. And uh, the very opening of 1 Kings, he can't, uh, he can't stay warm, and, and he's really out of the picture. He doesn't really know what's going on in the kingdom very much. And so that's when Adonijah picks up. So we're going to go all the way to, King, to, to chapter 11 and see the demise of Solomon. Now, we, uh, you've read about his wisdom. You've read about the queen of Sheba that comes. And there's all kinds of stories, secular history, about the queen of Sheba. And uh, it's very interesting about the relationship with Solomon and the spread of, uh, of that lineage that's there, okay? So, chapter 11 is where we get into some trouble. Now, King Solomon, after all these many years, after building the temple, after bringing the ark to the temple... After having a huge dedication, we got a whole chapter that's about the dedication service, about this beautiful prayer that he prays of dedication. Okay, he is a guy. He is a man that is really uh, doing mighty things for God. And then you get to chapter eleven, and it says, "Now King Solomon loved many foreign women." along with the daughter of Pharaoh. Pharaoh gave him his daughter as a wife. Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittite women. Is that a problem? Verse 2 says, From the nation concerning which the Lord, the yud heh vav God, had said to the people of Israel, You shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Now, you'll find that in Exodus 34. And instead of putting it on the screen, I thought it would be a little bit quicker if I just read it to you. 
This is the commandment that Solomon grew up learning. And remember Solomon, as well as all the other kings, hand wrote the scripture. That was one of their responsibilities at the very beginning. They had to sit and it's thought that they sat with a scribe that helped them. And they wrote out their own scripture. He knew the scripture. He had written it by hand. This is what the scripture says. Uh, chapter 34, Exodus, verse 11. Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Pezer. Pez Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. Take care lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you go. Lest it become a snare in your midst. You shall tear down their altars and break their pillars and cut down their Asherim. For you shall worship no other god for the Lord, yud heh vav -Heh, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and when they whore after the gods and sacrifice to their gods, and you are invited, you eat of his sacrifice, and you take of their daughters for your sons, and their daughters whore after their gods, and make your sons whore after their gods, you shall not make for yourself any gods. Did Solomon know that? But it ends this verse saying Solomon clung to these in love. Oh, we would never do anything like that, right? He had 700 wives who were princes and 300 concubines and his wives turned away his heart. His wives turned away his heart. That's right out of that other scripture. If you do this, they're going to turn you away from God. Right? For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart. That's the third time we see that turned away his heart. After other gods. Now, can you imagine this Solomon that prayed that beautiful dedication prayer? brought the actual Ark of the Covenant to the temple, was involved in all this kind of worship, would actually turn to worship other gods. Paul? Did God's presence fill the temple during the dedication? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He saw, he saw God's presence. It is, it is. And this is later. He says, his heart was not wholly true. His heart was not wholly true to the Lord, to yud heh vav -Heh, his God, as was the heart of David, his father. Now, he had an example before him. He watched David. And he's the wisest man that ever lived. But he messed up. He really messed up. Okay? And this is, says he was not wholly true to who? To the yud heh vav -Heh, To God. The Lord is just a title given. For Solomon went after Astoreth. That's the goddess of the Sidonians. And after Milcom the abomination of the Ammonites. Now, in Exodus 34, it names both, both of those and says, don't marry them. Do not let your daughters marry them. Do not let your sons marry them. Don't marry them. And Solomon went after their god, Astoreth. Now, I don't know if you've ever looked up to see 
who these are. That is supposedly a small statue that archaeologists have found of Astaroth or Asherah or Astarte. Those are the same name in different languages. And the list goes on. You, there are several other names that are there. It is a fertility goddess. And uh, it was worshipped by the ancient Canaanites. Who were the Canaanites? They're one of those little broader groups. A bunch of the others fall under them. All the people in the land of Canaan that God gave to Israel were called Canaanites. But some of them were other tribes also. That was an umbrella look, okay? So that includes the Philistines. Philistines are called Canaanites too, okay? So uh, this, if you look in some of the biblical archaeology, this is one of the statues, it's a little bitty, that they've uncovered. And it has the traditional two horns and the sun, which has gone through history and picked up by lots of different groups, okay? That is the fertility goddess that's worshipped by the Canaanites. Here's one that was found in, in the late 1800s, and it's pretty small. You can see the, the hand that holds it there. And that's a statue of the fertility goddess. I tell you, if I was looking at that, I would think, that looks kind of like an alien or something. I, I'm not sure I want that kind of fertility, right? Anyway, uh, that's the Astaroth, a Sherath. And we have all kinds of commands about to tear down, and you'll find over and over and over where they would go in and tear down or cut down the Astaroth poles, okay? They worshiped. It's similar to some of us older folks remember something about a maypole, okay? And we celebrated around them. Well, he went after the Astaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom. Now, that's one we don't see too much in print, but it is in the Bible several times. And it, the, the Word of God says, Milcon is the abomination of the Ammonites. Now, we don't know for sure what Milcon, what they actually worshipped. But this is a statue that they have found, uncovered, that they think represents Milcom. This comes from the 8th century BCE. So we're about the time period and it is a man and it's spelled multiple different ways. I put a couple there. And uh, they suspect from what all they got and the, the diggings that they've done that this was either the national god or at least a very popular god because it was in the cultural center, in the center of worship. And uh, he's written about, as we've seen in the Hebrew Bible and in archaeological finds from the former territory of Ammon. Okay? So we say that he's a national god. So that verse gave us Solomon did what was evil, in the sight of the Lord, in the sight of yud heh vav -Heh, and did not wholly follow the Lord. Didn't say that he wasn't following God. That's where we have a problem, I believe, is, as Christians. We, we don't realize that there's 100% that needs to be. You know, 5% or 10% is pretty good. It's better than average. You know, and so we're okay with that. No, God says it's all or nothing. You know? So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of Yudhe Vav and did not wholly follow 
yud hey vav hey God, as David, his father, had done. So, verse 7, seven's that number that we look for, right? It talks about completion. Then Solomon himself goes out and builds a high place for Himosh. It's the abomination of Moab. Now we're getting to the ones that we have been told over and over and over, stay away from them. Don't have anything to do with them. And for Molech, and we've read quite a bit about Molech, okay? The abomination of the Ammonites. Molech is is uh, associated with child sacrifice. Okay? And this is on the mountain of East Jerusalem. He builds these altars and worships them. Now, we don't have any images or idols that they've come up with that is about Himosh, Shimosh, or however you want to say that. But we do have this stone that they've uncovered and it's written in Hebrew, and it is called the Mesha steel. And uh, uh, let me just read you a little bit about that. It's a priceless source of information concerning this god, Himosh. Within its text, the inscriber mentions Himosh 12 times. He also names Mesha as the son of Himosh. And Mesha made it clear that he understood Hamosha's anger and the reason he allowed the Moabites to fall under the rule of Israel. The high place on which Mesha oriented the stone was dedicated to Hamosh. Now, this is a national deity of the Moabites, and the word Hamosh means destroyer, subduer, or it can mean the fish god. So if they had an idol and maybe it was a fish with a man's head or a man with a fish head or I don't know. We don't know. We don't have those. Don't know what it was that they were worshiping. Um, it's found in several places. In Judges 11, it talks about it, and we're reading it here in 1 Kings. So it was a national god worshiped by the ancient Moabites and the Ammonites. So that's verse 7 where he, Solomon goes out and builds an altar to Hemosh. Okay? And then the second part of that, he also builds one to Molech. Now we have a lot of history and writings about Molech. And you'll find different depictions, but most of them look similar to this. They may not be that big, but they had them Every community that worshipped Molech had their own statues that they had. And the story is that they built a huge fire uh, in the belly or under the arms. You'll see some drawings where there's an open fire under his outstretched arms. And parents would bring their babies and lay them in the arms of the statue and watch them burn to death. Now, I can't imagine. I mean, that, that just sounds like that's got to be fiction. It is prevalent in history. And I'm afraid that our country is inundated with child sacrifice. Because we know the thousands of children that have gone missing. We know a lot of that is sexual trafficking. But we also are reading more and more and more about blood sacrifices. Very interesting. Uh, read you what the, the dictionary says about Molech. Uh, theological. Molech was an ancient god worshipped by the people neighboring Israel during Old Testament times. While much about Molech's nature and origin are uncertain, 
The Bible mentions Molech on eight different occasions, providing some context regarding the problems associated with the ancient God. Theologians believe that Moloch, this name Molech or Moloch, L-O-C-K, it's written both ways in history, is a misvocalization or a foreigner speaking Hebrew with a Sotaki, what do you, what do we call that? Accent, okay, and uh, uh, of the word Melech. What is Melech? King. That's ascribed to God. King, Melech. Don't know that, but that's what some believe. Or it might be a a, a vocalization that's patterned after the word Boshet. And that means shame, shameful. So it's a derogatory about God uh, in some way, okay? So we don't know about that. Um, as I did a little research on these gods, trying to think about how does this relate to us? Now, we're not going to go out and put up an Asherah pole, I don't think, or build an altar to Molech. But what is it that we do that's similar to this? And so I started digging a little bit. You know, of course, you know, we talk about abortion and all these things that are very similar and just as grotesque as what these ancient people did. But keeps popping up over and over and over and over about the Bohemian, what is it called? Grove, the Bohemian Grove where world leaders gather annually in California. And it's rumored, I actually looked, watched a video that the guy says proves it, and it's kind of maybe, uh, where they have offer a child blood sacrifice. Presidents, world leaders gather once a year. It's a big celebration in California. Could that actually happen in our country? So, this is the Canaanite god, which is kind of that umbrella with Philistines and a bunch of others that fall under there. And uh, it is depicted like that. It's depicted like this with a bull's head. All of those have two horns. This one has down underneath it a big fire deal. Actually, the caption says that there are seven chambers, so you could sacrifice seven babies at a time. Crazy. Now, let's get back into Solomon. What happened to Solomon? He went off. For years and years, you know, he's the guy that God said, Solomon... Ask me whatever you want. And Solomon had a wise question. Request. I don't know how to lead this nation. Show me. And God said, I'm going to give you wisdom beyond measure. You'll be the wisest man that ever was. And since you ask for that, which is not for yourself, but for the nation, then I'm going to give you wealth and prestige and honor also. So here's Solomon. Has everything. And he still made some bad decisions, according to God. Verse 8 says, And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrificed to their gods. And Yudhe Vavhe, God, the Lord, was angry with Solomon. Is it a good thing when God gets angry? 
because his heart had turned away from Yudhei Vavhe, Yehovah, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. God came and talked to him two different times and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what Yehovah, yud vav commanded. And so when you don't, you get this word, therefore, and it tells you, what it's there for. The Lord, yud heh vav said to Solomon, Since this has been your practice, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I've commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servants. Now, as I was going through this, I see Solomon doing all the right things. Year after year after year. God blessing him and just unbelievable. And then I see him branching out and using his wisdom and not following God's commandments. And I thought, Maybe he thought that was the old covenant. And it's been done away with. And now we have this new thing that he's doing with me. And I'm a political figure of the world. People come to me from everywhere. I think that I could marry these foreign wives and it would really benefit Israel. Uh, It would be a blessing to the world us being able to share our knowledge and gain knowledge. and So Egyptians and Phoenicians and Africans and all. And so in Solomon's mind, I think He thought this was a benefit to God, and it was good. Oh, yeah, it was written back then, but way back then. I mean, that was in the Exodus. And Solomon hadn't read those. I'm the Lord, I don't change. I don't do away with the law. Sound familiar? I think you know people like that. So as we examine ourselves, what do we do? Well, God said, if you don't keep my commandments and my statutes, it's not going to be good for you. Don't marry those foreign wives. Now, I don't know that it's marrying the foreign wives. What I think it is, is it's being disobedient to what God said, don't do. So, we can't do the logic and say, well, God didn't really mean that. He means something else. We just have to take it at its face value and do it. Paul first, then we'll go to Deborah. Well, yeah, it, it comes down the line and it, there are great similarities there. Probably is. It's a fertility of the right, right, exactly. It is, it is a celebration of the fertility goddess and it is. Right. right, right, yeah. Devery? Okay. 
Uh-huh. Okay, so how does this relate to us? You know, we could have said, well, I bet Solomon never read Exodus 34. You know, but we know better. But we can say, I have friends that I don't think have ever read Exodus 34. They don't see any reason to. But we need to, and we need to know what it means and what it means for us today. So we as individuals have to have a relationship with God and let God deal with us about how we keep his statutes, his commandments, his laws. Greg, you were going to say something? Oh. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, this, this lesson is a tough one, I think. I, I hope that it makes you contemplate and think as it has me. So what do we do with it? Well, we're going to have to take it to God. And uh, depending on where you are in your journey, you're going to have to say, God, I'm not sure I understand all about this, but would you show me what part of your law you want me to keep? And I think he will. I think he'll begin to open the whole thing so that as you read it, you see how it all fits together, how the sacrifice of the Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua, goes all the way back to the covenant of Abraham and how all these come together and they all work together. Oh, I know that a big part of our Christian society uh, have some real problems with keeping the law because they say you're under the law. Well, we're not under the law. We are saved by grace through the Lord Jesus Christ's sacrifice. And because we're his children, we look at his law and realize that that is what is best for us. And so we begin to study his law and figure out how it applies in our lives. And then we become obedient to it. I don't know anybody that became obedient to the whole thing the first day. Do you? It is a growing experience. It's like those kids on their way to Jerusalem learning about it is really good when brothers get along. Okay? Well, I don't know any kids that heard that one time and it changed their life and they never had a problem again, never argued with their neighbors, right? It's a learning process. And as we mature and as we grow as Christians, then we begin to take on a little bit deeper understanding of God's Word and apply it to our lives and let that become the guidelines of where we are. And what a blessing it is. But we have to be very cautious that we don't make the same mistakes that King David made, and the same mistakes that King Solomon made. Why are they in our Bibles? Why didn't God just put all the ones that were perfect? You know? They're real people. That's right. It wouldn't be. And, and. There you go. There you go. They are just people, just like we are. And they make mistakes, just like we do. But they get saved, just like we do. And they get forgiven, just like we do. So when we repent, that means turn from it, we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins 
and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when we are cleansed from all unrighteousness, we become righteous. We become the children of God that are clean. And that's what God wants us to be. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for the time that we can come and discuss your word. We thank you, Lord, that you uh, open these portions to us. And Lord, that we can have just an insight into what has happened in our history. Lord, we thank you for what we can learn from King Solomon, the wisdom that he had. Lord, we thank you that we can see the mistakes that he's made, and Lord, that you caution us not to make mistakes like that. And Father, we see that you told him, because you didn't follow my statutes and my commandments is the reason for the punishment. We just ask, Lord, that you bless us, that you give us understanding into your word, that you open our hearts, and that we may love one another. And we just see that it is blessed when brothers live in unity. And Father, we just ask that you direct us as a church body, that we may be consistent in our lifestyle, that we may be consistent in our studying of your word, that day in and day out, we will hide your word in our heart that we might not sin against you. And Lord, that you will use us in a great and mighty way. We thank you for the time that we've had this evening for the discussion. We ask that as we leave that you impress it in our hearts about being diligent to follow your commands. Thank you, Father, for all that you do. We pray these things in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Have a blessed evening. Glad you were here.